has been general support from the countries of 10 countries which we have diplomatic relations. But there are some, you know, of course, uh, there are some uh, 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 concerns on some specific issues. And uh, we have agreed that uh, these two documents, we will be discussed uh, in the afterwards and until we have uh, reached an agreement. Let's go to Singapore and speak to Rajiv Biswas, who's an Asia-Pacific chief economist at S&P Global Market Intelligence. Thank you so much indeed uh, for your uh, time. Um, Thank you. I want to just repeat something that I said at the top of the program. You probably weren't with us, right? It's David Panuelo, who's the president of the Federated States of Micronesia, one of the participants at that meeting in Fiji. And he said to his colleagues who were sitting around that he didn't like the idea of this deal with China he said that uh, it could lead, at best, to a new Cold War, at worst, to a new World War. I mean, OK, that may be going a bit too far, but clearly there are some nations, what would they be so unhappy about in terms of this deal that China is offering? I think, uh, obviously, if we talk about more strategic issues, there are concerns about uh, uh, f about what may lie ahead from various countries. So I think throughout the Asia-Pacific, there's obviously this concern about balancing relations between the U.S. and China, and that's certainly also playing out in the, in the Pacific Islands as well. But I think if we step back a bit and look at the role of China uh, in the Asia-Pacific, it is the largest economy in the Asia-Pacific. It's about 50 percent of the Asia-Pacific GDP. And it's also the second largest economy in the world. So from an e economic perspective, clearly China does have an important role to play in regional development assistance for developing countries in the Asia-Pacific as, as more widely globally. So I think from that perspective, uh, a number of the Pacific Island countries are still very much engaged with China in terms of their own development assistance needs. And, you know, th they are very vulnerable to climate change. They've been hit very hard by the COVID pandemic. Their tourism sectors have been devastated. So they are looking for international donor assistance. Um, and China, obviously, is one of the biggest donors. So I think from that economic engagement perspective, there's certainly a lot of traction uh, amongst many of the countries in the Pacific Island states. However, when we look more broadly beyond that, then obviously different countries have different points of view on more strategic related uh, aspects. But I think the economic engagement is already significant uh, between China and the Pacific Islands. And I think it will grow in future because China is continuing to grow uh, economic power, um, both globally and in the Pacific. There was a strange news conference at the end of the meeting, uh, Rajiv. There was the Fijian prime minister and the Chinese foreign minister. They spoke for about half an hour. And then at the end of their speeches, journalists tried to ask questions and they both just left their podiums. And that's why we had that clip of the Chinese ambassador to Fiji, because I suppose Beijing felt that someone should come out and explain something which the foreign minister was apparently refusing to do. What we don't know here, and I don't suppose you do either, but many people will look at China's investments in Africa, as well as, actually, Sri Lanka is a very good example at the moment. The investments and the loans that China gives to countries, makes in countries, many of them, some of them, end up being hugely in debt. Should Pacific nations be worried about being caught in a similar situation? I think there's been a huge learning curve for developing countries in terms of the Belt and Road projects, as well as for China. And the World Bank and uh, the United Nations have uh, worked with China to try to improve the way that lending is being done uh, from the Belt and Road Project from China to developing countries to reduce that kind of vulnerability that's been arising in some of the earlier Belt and Road projects. So I think it still remains to be seen how that new approach will work, uh, because it is relatively recent. And of course, during the pandemic, there's been quite a disruption of those kind of infrastructure projects. But uh, there, there is that recognition both by the recipient countries, the developing countries 
in Asia and also uh, more broadly worldwide, as well as from China, that there does need to be reform in the way these loans have been operating. And uh, because now there's IMF engagement, there's World Bank engagement and uh, United Nations efforts as well, uh, the hope is that that will create a better framework or lending, because of course, if it's properly managed, it, I think it can be a force for good. And I think one important example of that is the uh, AIIB, a multilateral lending institution that uh, was very much initiated by China, but it's uh, only one of the many members. And that's been lending for infrastructure finance projects in Asia, but it's got a very strong international best practice model for doing that. So those sort of new approaches, I think, are valuable in ensuring that developing countries get the most out of these kind of uh, lending initiatives. Rajiv Biswas, thank you so much indeed, Rajiv. Really appreciate it. Thank you.